Once Around Sagittarius A Star, a fascinating tale of the discovery and just how far we've come in a uh, hundred years in understanding the dark heart of the middle of our galaxy. So Sagittarius, the constellation, is in, in the southern part of the sky. It's just visible from my observing site here in Cambridge in the summer months when it just clears the hedge. Um, and it's supposed to represent an archer, but I'm afraid whenever I look at it, all I can see is a teapot. Now, just next to the teapot, marked by the little red ring, that is the area we're interested in. And the interest began with this guy, Karl Jansky, and his merry-go-round pictured at the bottom of the screen there, which is a radio antenna on a turntable. And he was using it to try to identify sources of interference that were getting into his equipment. And he was able to rotate the antenna and work out the direction in which any radio signals were coming. So it allowed him to do things like track thunderstorms. But he found a strange hiss coming into the antenna and couldn't identify where this was from to begin with. What he noticed was after a year of study that it seemed to be cycling on a daily basis. And he reasoned that that suggested it was coming from the sun. Uh, the sun was known to be a source of radio waves in other ways, so this seemed entirely reasonable. Now, in fact, it drifted from day to day, and the repeat period was not 24 hours. It was 23 hours and 56 minutes, so it could not be the sun. It actually was fixed to the apparent sky rotation of the distant stars coming from the constellation of Sagittarius, and that is towards the center of the Milky Way. So we have here a radio intensity map of sources uh, of the whole sky here. When you see one of these elliptical diagrams like this, it's a map of the whole sky unwrapped as if you had wrapped a sphere in uh, wrapping paper and then tried to unwrap it. You'll find that the shape of an ellipse like this is the one that you need to cover a football, for example. So the uh, intense spots that of white there are the really powerful radio sources, followed by red, and then the dark blues and blacks, obviously, are where it's a fairly radio quiet environment. You can see a few extra galactic radio sources dotted about, but the majority is coming from the plane of the Milky Way with those white spots distributed along it. But if we look with some modern instruments and we delve right into the center of our galaxy, we can go right in using uh, different wavelengths, looking at X-rays and at infrared uh, radiation. It's very hard to use visible because of all the dirt and dust that you can see along the galactic plane blocking our line of sight. But what we discovered was that right in the center, there was a strong source of X-rays associated with hot gas and a, quite a large cluster of stars. And so if you zoom in even more, you see a region of hot gas with a dense core of central stars clustering together there. And again, you can zoom in again with the amazing Chandra's X-ray telescope and find a very intense region as a small disk of um, material is giving off very hot X-rays. This is due to electrons whirling around in a strong magnetic field that gives this sort of X-ray emission. And you can see the image there showing that amazingly hot disk. So deep inside, if we look at the star cluster first, you can actually delve into it and using infrared, track the orbits of the very central group of stars, which all appear to be orbiting around in elliptical orbits at various orientations around the point marked with the red cross in this animation. And there's no visible object at that location in these wavelengths. So what we can do is look at the star S2, which is the one that's 
on the nice elliptical orbit in the center, coming down from the top now, whips around the object and goes back out again, giving us that lovely ellipse. It takes 15.2 years to do so, and the close approach is estimated as 120 astronomical units. And so we can use Kepler's third law of planetary motion to figure out the mass of the central controlling object. I've done this a number of times in some of my other talks, but this one works out at 4 million times the mass of the sun at that location where we don't really see very much. Here's another animation of a few other stars that are even closer than S2. S62 shown on the diagram there. That's within 16 astronomical units, so less than the orbit of Uranus. And a couple of the others are shown there. But one of them, S4714, is the record holder. And it's closer in than 12.6 AU, the orbit of Saturn, 2 billion kilometers, just under 2 billion. Now, that figure is important because it's quite difficult to work out what you would have if you had 4 million solar masses crammed into such a tiny area, and yet we don't seem to see very much um, by way of an optical component. And in fact, uh, Karl Schwarzschild, who was a German scientist, he was actually in the trenches calculating artillery trajectories during the First World War, and for a bit of light entertainment, he solved Einstein's newly published general relativity equations to worked out that there was a formula for the size of an object and its mass connecting the two. Basically, if your object was smaller than the radius calculated with his formula, then for a given mass, the escape velocity would be greater than the speed of light. And this marks a boundary in space known as the event horizon. It's the radius around a black hole um, where if you cross going in past that, you can never come out again. Nothing, no matter, no light, no information is able to cross from the inside to the outside. It's a boundary in space time. And there's a very simple formula that he ended up with, having solved the very complicated equations, which is that that radius is two times Newton's constant G over C squared, the speed of light, times the mass. So it's just proportional to the mass. And with that, you can calculate that 4 million solar masses would give a radius of 12 million kilometers for the event horizon. Now, that's a lot less than the 2 billion that we've seen a star approach to. And so uh, there's no danger that uh, the black hole would have actually eaten these stars. So at least it makes sense that they're able to orbit around it. And so if we jump forward to the most modern observations of the object in the center there, this has come from the EHT, the Event Horizon Telescope which isn't a telescope, it isn't really one telescope, it's a combination of radio telescopes linked from all around the world, creating one vast array with the distance between the extremes of the array being as far apart as the diameter of the Earth. Um, so you get the effect of the resolution of a telescope the size of the planet you, you don't get as much uh, radiation, as much light, or as many radio waves as you would get if the whole of the planet was turned into a dish. But the resolution, the fineness with which you can discern things, is determined not by the whole area of a dish, but by the distance between its extreme edges. And so by this technique of aperture synthesis, creating one linked array, we get the effect of very, very sharp images. And of course, we can just expose for as long as we like to get the total uh, amount of radiation to come into the telescope. So we don't need to cover the whole area. This was a technique pioneered in Cambridge by Martin Ryle um, in the uh, period after the Second World War uh, with a lot of spare radar equipment in the birth days of uh, radio astronomy. 
And what that has enabled us to do is pull together one image of what's going on deep in the heart of Sagittarius A star. The EHT created the image in 2017, but there was about a five year delay before the image was released. And this is what we got. You've got that uh, bright accretion ring around the central dark patch where the black hole must be. And you've even got a hint top left and bottom right of some material jetting away perhaps. Now, you've got to allow for the fact that in creating these images, the, the light is coming away, or the radio waves are coming away from the hot disk, passing the black hole and being bent by the enormous gravity, the uh, warping of space-time caused by the mass in the centre, means that we can actually see round behind it and see the far side of the disk flipped up and brightened, which is giving us that bright spot at the top right there. Now, that image was amazing enough, but they've improved on it more recently by looking at the polarization of the light. And I just find this incredible that for an object 27,000 light years away, perhaps 30,000 light years away, depending on whose measurements you take, um, we are seeing this amazing detail in the accretion disk. And this is the twisting of the magnetic field caused by the rotation in the central black hole, uh, spinning very rapidly as material has fallen into it. Of course, the angular momentum goes into the black hole and is retained. And so rather like a skater pulling their arms in and going into a rapid spin, these things end up spinning very rapidly indeed. And that can cause those jets to emerge as it twists and wraps the magnetic field. Um, and if there's any material falling into the black hole, some of it tends to get jetted out along those uh, magnetic field lines at the poles. And talking of material falling in, in 2002, a cloud of gas was detected heading in towards the black hole and within the accretion zone it might well have ended up being utterly doomed and eaten and the picture on the right is the the s stars orbiting around the central uh, region and a simulation of this cloud of gas that was detected hurtling inwards it's called g2 and it was tracked and we've got a little picture a series of overlays year on year from 2006 through till 2014. And the picture shows the colors there, which are indicating the Doppler shift uh, due to the motion, the rapid retreat and then whipping around the far side and coming back out again. Um, and it did indeed survive. It was not turned into the black hole's lunch. So it survived the encounter and the blue shift of the final image is it whipping round behind uh, Sagittarius A star and coming back out towards us. So it, it wasn't feeding on this gas directly, but ultimately I think this cloud of gas will spiral inwards and eventually will get eaten up by the uh, black hole. Now our black hole was uh, right in the center there. Sagittarius A star is known to have been feeding about six million years ago. So our ancient ancestors living in trees perhaps would have been treated to an amazing light show up in the sky um, in the region of Sagittarius. And we know this because of the Fermi bubbles. These are two huge hot regions of uh, very tenuous but extremely hot gas giving off X-rays marked in blue and gamma rays marked in the purple areas. So intense is the radiation and the energy. These things are at millions of degrees and are the results of an outburst from Sagittarius A star creating these enormous jets of material whipped up by that spinning, rotating magnetic field, hurling material out of the galaxy above and below to the north and south poles of the galaxy and creating these enormous bubbles of uh, extremely energetic material out in space. 
And so uh, this is not a photograph, of course, because we can't stand outside our galaxy and look back in, but it is a map that has been generated from observations. So I hope you've enjoyed that tour of Sagittarius A star. And I just wanted to leave with this comparison because the Event Horizon Telescope first released an image of a black hole, the one in the middle of the galaxy known as Messier 87 in Virgo. And it produced a very similar image with the hot accretion disk and the dark region in the center. Uh, so that's the one on the left. And Sagittarius A star, the image that was released later, is on the right. And just for giving you some sense of scale, uh, the Sagittarius A star is much, much smaller. It, it's about uh, a thousand times less massive than the black hole in the center of M87. And correspondingly, everything is scaled right down so that, in fact, the accretion disk would fit right in this, to the uh, Mercury's orbit uh, around the sun, whereas the uh, dark region of M87's black hole well, you can see Pluto's orbit marked there, so truly vast by comparison. And the position of Voyager 1 would just about be on the uh, entering the accretion disk. Quite incredible. So I hope you've enjoyed that, and I will just leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>